We continue our studies tonight in the book of Acts and continuing to look at divine direction, things that should motivate us to do the will of God, things that should clearly motivate us to godly Christian living. If it doesn't end in that, the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. If it does not motivate us to that, then we know that we are not in the center of God's will. The will of God, how important is it? The will of God to know it, that clearly is step number one, but the will of God to do it, and there's where the rub is. We have not only to develop the desire to do the will of God, but God has given to us the empowerment to do his will. God has given us motivation to do his will. Motivation that is not only for his glory, which is the key underlying motivation of all that we do or all that we should be motivated to do, but he has given us the motivation actually of personal gain. Oh, not in this world, but gain that is in eternity. The motivation of heavenly rewards. The motivation that an athlete has to get the crown. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And Paul wrote that and referred to himself. If the apostle Paul feared being a castaway, how much more should we fear being a castaway? We'll talk about those verses a little bit tonight, the Lord willing. But we need to know the will of God. We need to be highly motivated to do the will of God. God has provided the necessary empowerment for us to do his will. God has provided the necessary goals upon which to focus our attention. And God has given promises concerning doing his will. Macedonia, here I come, divine direction, part number seven. Before we begin, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege of being here tonight. We thank you that you actually have a divine will for our lives. We know you're sovereign. We know that nothing comes to pass apart from your sovereign control. And yet, in the midst of all that, you hold us accountable. We cannot merely say, why has the potter made me thus? O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Our gracious Heavenly Father, teach us the balance of your word, the absolute sovereignty of God, the clear responsibility of every man, woman, boy, and girl. And we will be held accountable, whether we like it or not, whether we argue about it or not, we will be held accountable for knowing your will and for doing your will in the way that pleases you, not in the flesh, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in obedience to the word of God and to the glory of God. And so, Father, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we've been talking about the will of God and motivation, we're asking the question, and we need to keep this in our mind as we go through this, why am I doing what I am doing? Why am I doing what I am doing? We've talked about it in relation to food, in relation to Thanksgiving, in relation to speech. We've talked about the false motives with the underall general category of hypocrisy as the first evil false motive. We've looked at 31 different passages dealing with hypocrisy and its multifaceted manifestations. We looked at the second evil motive, which is pride. And we saw that Jesus gave us a list of various evil motives, including pride that stem from the heart. We saw that pride is deadly in church leadership, that pride is deadly in the life of any believer, and definitely means that he or she is not in the will of God. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. We looked at the third evil motive, which was covetousness. And we had to ask ourselves, am I motivated by what I do, by 
or what I think or what I say by my covetousness? If the answer is yes, we're not fulfilling the will of God for our lives. Why do I hoard all the stuff that I hoard? Jesus made a point of it. He said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. The world around us tells us, You are what you own. And that's hogwash. Because Jesus said, A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. It's listed among all the wicked sins of the flesh, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. That's Romans 1.29. We're told that it should never be part of the life of a believer. Ephesians 5.3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. We saw it has some serious ramifications for eternity future. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You may get there, but you won't have any inheritance. You know, sometimes there are children of very wealthy people and they are looking forward so much to getting the stuff when daddy or grandpa passes away and he dies and they're licking their chops and the will is pulled out and read and it says to my son Joe who is a no good Nick I leave nothing but a loaf of bread and they say no it couldn't be I'm leaving it all to my daughter Susie dear people some of us are going to get to heaven and we're going to discover that we have no inheritance because we decided we'd get it all here. Covetousness. The man who is covetous, who is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Mortify, put to death. Therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. We're exhorted in the book of Hebrews. You get the idea this is a rather major topic in the New Testament because people have not changed. Let your conversation, that is your manner of life, be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What would you rather have, Jesus with you or a big bank account? The fourth evil motive that we looked at is sloth. And we asked ourselves, am I motivated by, to do what I'm doing, thinking or saying, by sloth? Why is it that I am taking my time off? Why is it that I'm resting and lollygagging around and hanging out and not doing productive work that counts for eternity? There's a lot about sloth in the Bible. Slothfulness casts us into a deep sleep, an idle soul shall suffer hunger. He that slothful in his work is brother to him that is great waster. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty only to want. Mental attitudes, as we saw, precede physical action. Peter tells us, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, that is, because you've got your eyes on eternity, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. If you have your eyes focused on eternity, it will result in a life filled with diligence, not a life filled with sloth. And so that brings us to tonight, the fifth evil motive. I mentioned it just in passing last week. The fifth evil motive is gluttony. I must ask myself the question, am I motivated to do what I am doing, thinking or saying, by gluttony? The answer is yes, I'm not fulfilling the will of God for my life. And you might say, oh, well, that's not my problem. Well, let's see. Gluttony, after all, that's, you know, that's sort of that really obscene form of eating that's way out there, isn't it? Gluttony is actually connected to a number of other sins. Now, I mentioned these verses last week. I'll read them again because it gives us the backdrop for what I want to look at in the rest of the New Testament. This is out of the book of Deuteronomy, and I read these to you last week, Deuteronomy 21.20. They shall say unto the elders of his city, our, This our son is, a, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Now, we've already talked about stubbornness and rebellion in our morning worship services, 
Now that's connected to witchcraft and idolatry and immorality, vices, gross immorality. This, our son, is stubborn and rebellious, and that's connected to he's a glutton and a drunkard. Two sins of the lack of self-control. Two sins that affect the flesh. Two sins that affect the way in which we are able to function in this world. Where we're called upon to run the race with boldness that is set before us. The glutton can hardly move. The drunkard moves in staggering movements and can't control how he talks. I've worked with a lot of drunks. I used to work in a rescue mission. We'd go out and drag them off the street, feed them a bowl of soup, share the gospel with them, and some of them came to Christ. And it changed their lives. Proverbs 23, 21, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Psalm 1, 19, 70, Their heart is fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. Now why is gluttony so dangerous? The reason? The Bible compares it to idolatry. And we've already seen what idolatry is connected to. Falling down and worshiping false gods, and God curses that, he hates that. He condemns people for it, he puts them to death for it. Look what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 19. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. That's idolatry, folks. They have another God. Their God is to eat. Their God is their stomach. They must satisfy their God with the offerings that they make to their God. Just like they bring the offerings of all the fanciest food and very best cuts of meat and plop it down in front of that fat Buddha statue. They do the same thing. They plop it down inside their fat bellies. Whose God is their belly. Whose glory is in their shame. Who mind earthly things. Oh, folks. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3, to set your affections on things that are above, not on things that are in the earth. Mortify your members that are upon the earth, but put your affections on things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. But the folks who are gluttons, they're the folks who mind earthly things. Now you might want to reverse that and think about it for a moment. Do you mind earthly things? That's the focus of the flesh. Has that perhaps backpedaled into the sin of gluttony? Focused on things of earth. Gluttony is connected to that. Listen to Romans 16, 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, they don't serve Jesus. Does that perhaps mean they're serving something else? Or someone else? Does that mean that perhaps if Jesus is not their Lord and God, that they've got another Lord and God? Paul tells you in the next phrase. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Sort of dangerous, isn't it? Serving your own belly may put you in the category of those that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. By good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. They make great excuses. 1 Corinthians 6.13 Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. And you know what he compares it to here in this verse? Next phrase. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. We think meat for the body, and the body for meat. Hey, that's why we're here. He ties that to fornication. He's already tied it to gluttony, I mean, I tied it to idolatry. Now he ties it to fornication. And he said, don't you realize your body is not for meat? 
Your body is for the Lord. You know, we tend to overlook these verses, but these are verses that are dealing with the sin of gluttony and putting it in the category of idolatry. God connects sins that we don't always connect. And so I think it's really important for us to learn the divine viewpoint on all these areas of life. We've already seen some of those connections in the morning message. Now we have connected idolatry with gluttony. See where the daisy chain leads from there. Gluttony connects to idolatry, is connected to iniquity, which is vile immorality, is connected to witchcraft. You remember that verse out of 1 Samuel? For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath rejected thee from being king. Three verses here we've just given to you out of the New Testament that connect gluttony to idolatry. That's a rather nasty list to be in, isn't it? Witchcraft and iniquity, which is vile immorality and idolatry. It's not just a connection made in the Old Testament. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh, gluttony, folks, is one of the sins of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, the two that we just mentioned a moment ago, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. You know what revelings is? That's having the big gluttonous party where everybody sits around and stuffs till they throw it up, and then they come back and they eat some more. And if they don't manage to throw it up, they go outside, and the Romans did this. And they stick the finger down their throat until they throw it up so that they can come back and stuff some more. It's in the same list here as witchcraft and idolatry and murder and drunkenness and adultery and fornication. The New Testament has something to say about this. Not inheriting the kingdom of God is a rather serious issue for not bringing the flesh into subjection. 1 Corinthians 9.27 <clears throat> But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others I myself should be a castaway. Do you have your body in control? Do you have your body in control? The sins of the flesh means that your body is not in control. Adultery and fornication, your body's not in control. Gluttony, your body's not in control. Paul says, I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. It is a choice of the will. And you say, I will not be controlled by the flesh, I will be controlled by the Spirit of God. I will yield the members of my body, Romans chapter 6, I will yield the members of my body, including my mouth and my belly, to Jesus Christ. And you do it on a daily basis. Romans 6 is daily basis. Romans chapter 12 where you present your body as a living sacrifice is a once and for all uh, obligation that each of us has. But the Romans 6 passage deals with the day by day by day by day by day by day presenting every member of our body to Christ for his service. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest by any means when I have preached to others I myself should be a castaway. Being a castaway means that you are not fit for use by the master. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. Nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now remember iniquity is connected to idolatry and gluttony in the Bible as one of the great sins of the flesh, a sin that we don't even like to admit that we are committing. And he goes on, verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, that is, the sins of the flesh that he's been talking about, including gluttony, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and neat, that is, fitting, for the master's use and prepare to every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Being a castaway means that you're not fit for the master's service. You need to purge yourself from the sins of the flesh. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, 
and meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. How you care for your body is important because of many reasons. Let me give you a few. First of all, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 beginning in verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. What are you doing with your body? We always like to think of this in context of sex sins and things like that, really, really horrible stuff, or drug addiction or alcoholism. Folks, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Gluttony defiles your body. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. We jump down three chapters, 1 Corinthians 6.19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? How much do you think a friend of yours would appreciate it if suppose they went on vacation and they asked you to house sit for them? So you went over to their house and totally trashed their house. You got all the stuff out of the refrigerator, you sort of spilled it around, you left it on the floor. You took bags of chips into the living room, watched TV, and scattered the chips all over the place. Oh, you left the door open and it rained inside and a bunch of stuff got wet. You brought a dog in with you and the dog did its thing all over the house. Do you think they would appreciate it when they came home to their house? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Your body doesn't belong to you. When Jesus died for you, he didn't just die to, to take you to heaven and get your spirit up there. He died for you. You are body, soul, and spirit. And Jesus is the one who is the redeemer of the body as well as the soul and the spirit. What do you think the resurrection is about? We have resurrection bodies. We should not be in the process of destroying the temple of the Holy Ghost because we are not our own. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Interesting here, we find the temple contrasted with the temple of idols. Remember the issue of idolatry and how it's connected to gluttony and to witchcraft? And the witchcraft going on in those pagan temples? and the worship of the Holy God going on in the temple of God, which temple ye are. Folks, there are a lot of passages that we just tend to jump over and don't ever connect the dots. Point B, under how you care for your body is important because it affects other Christians who are part of the temple that God is building. Ephesians 2.21 In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And he's just been talking about each of us and the gifts that God has given to us and how he is taking us each as living stones and putting us together. Your little temple is part of the big temple that is being built. Do you want to be the one rotten two by four filled with termites that is so rotten that when it's put in, it causes a wall of the temple to collapse. Gluttony is a sin that does that. Point C, overcomers will be a permanent part of the heavenly temple. Revelation 3.12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is a new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Interesting to track temple through the New Testament. 
individual bodies temples individual Christians in those individual bodies forming a holy temple some of them because of the way they have served Christ here and who have overcome the world the flesh includes gluttony and the devil pillars pillars in the temple the heavenly temple described in Revelation chapter 3 point D under why how you care for your body is important because the glutton will not be prepared for the race and the fight of the Christian life the glutton will not be prepared for the race and the fight of the Christian life 1 Corinthians 9 24 know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize so run that ye may obtain verse 26 I therefore so run not as uncertainly so fight I not as one that beateth the air and then the verse that we've read already but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when I preach unto others I myself should be a castaway Galatians 2 Paul speaking about how God had called him and then communicated to him what he was supposed to do and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles but privately to them which were of reputation now here Paul applies those verses we've just read to himself lest by any means I should run or had run in vain he looked at the Christian life as a strenuous race Galatians 5 7 ye did run well who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth in running your race do you have one of the motivations that hinders you in your Christian life a motivation for gluttony you're moved by that you look in the refrigerator and you say you know I'm running kind of low on the fancy stuff that I usually get and I I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna get me a lot more because I'm gonna have a real feast this Friday what motivates you remember your body is a temple remember you're in a race Philippians 2 16 holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain Hebrews 12 1 wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us uh, gluttony does doesn't it and let us run with patience the race that is set before us 1st Corinthians 9 26 I therefore so run not as uncertainly so fight I not as one that beateth the air 1st Timothy 6 12 fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses 2nd Timothy 4 7 when you get to the end of your life can you say this I have fought a good fight I know it's a fight for some of us different people have different besetting sins some sins tempt some people more than other sins tempt them Gluttony may be the sin that tempts you. Maybe it's something else. You're going to have to fight a fight. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Hebrews 10.32 But called to affliction the former days in which after you were illuminated ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Hebrews 11.34 Quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, wax valiant in fight. If, oh yeah that's just those guys back in the Old Testament no he's giving it to you as an illustration of faith you are in a fight and part of your fight is not just with the world and part of your fight is not just with the devil part of your fight is with the flesh turn to flight the armies of aliens let me be very blunt obese people have a hard time running and obese people have a hard time fighting with any endurance if I remember my statistics correctly because I've heard this from several of my medical children and I've also heard it from the doctor who cares for me and across the river over in Philadelphia over 75 percent of the children in the United States are considered obese that's not good folks that's the generation we've been raising how do you get obese <clears throat> I mean it's a simple question how do you get obese 
Well, I get obese because uh, I scratch my elbows 47 times a day. No, no, that's not the problem. Well, I've gotten obese because I walk five miles a day. Mm, no, don't think that's the answer. How do we get obese? By not controlling how much and how often we put into our mouths. Gluttony is a sin of the flesh we don't want to admit. But gluttony is a sin that is all around us and it gives clear manifestation that is one of the tolerated sins of American Christianity. It's one of those little sins. It's one of those not so important sins. It's one of those sins that we overlook because after all we all do it every now and then. Do you remember what God connected it to in the passages that we've just read? He connects it to idolatry. He collects it, connects it to vice, to uh, vile immorality. He connects it to witchcraft. He connects it to drunkenness. He connects it to rebellion. He connects it to stubbornness. Folks, read what the Bible says. I just read you a few of those verses. Connecting gluttony to all of those things that we'd say, oh, those are the big sins. God puts it in the same category. God puts it in that same list of the works of the flesh. Where murder is found, and adultery is found, and fornication is found. It's in the same list in Galatians chapter 5. But that's the sin of choice, or one of the many sins of choice in American Christianity today. Don't just say, ah, but you got to excuse me because it's genetic. It's genetic. I inherited the I will be fat genes from my parents. It's their fault. You know something? That dog won't fly. If we could use that argument, it would be like the drunk saying, my alcoholism is genetic. And there are alcoholics who argue that, okay? And there are scientists who say, yeah, there is a weakness in the genes toward alcohol. So they say, my alcoholism is genetic, or like the homosexual saying, my homosexuality is genetic. And there has been this great argument going on in the so-called scientific community that homosexuality is really a genetic thing. My homosexuality is genetic. Or the whoremonger or the pedophile saying, I'm just over a sex. God made me that way with lots of sex drive. You know? God doesn't give a whole pass to the drunk, or to the whoremonger, or to the pedophile, or to the sodomite by saying, oh, your alcoholism, your hypersex drive, your pedophilia, your homosexuality are genetic? Well, in that case, it's okay. Listen, folks. 1 Corinthians 10.13 is still in the book. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. You know what the way of escape may be? Going on a fast. Quit eating so much. Quit eating so often. He said, but I don't like that way of escape. Well, you know what? There were people in World War II who crawled through sewers, and you've heard me tell you those stories, to get out of concentration camps and to escape from the Nazis and to run through the middle of the snowing woods, freezing cold. Those were not pleasant ways of escape, but they got out. We can't argue that it's genetic. Because what you're doing then is you're shaking your finger at God and saying, you made me this way. It's your fault. You know, you can be a little Miss Goody Two Shows and everything else, but you can still be classified by God with idolaters and witches if you're a glutton. And one of your motives in life is gluttony. It's one of those sins of the American church that's swept under the carpet. Question, do you eat to live or do you live to eat? Several years ago, I was reading a national news magazine. It was for an annual pancake eating contest up in one of the northern Midwest states. And it had this full color picture spread across the top of the article 
of many very gigantic fat men. And one of those men was wearing a sign that said, I'll never forget this, Hog Jowls is my name, Eaton is my game. And there they were busy stuffing pancakes in. What a weird competition. Like all sins, backing out of gluttony is difficult. And losing the weight that we've gained through gluttony is even harder. You know, a little less than a year ago, I went to the airport to pick up a man who was in his late 50s, and I couldn't find him. Nobody on the sidewalk outside the baggage claim area, nobody looked like the man that I knew. <laughs> when I finally did find him, I never would have recognized him except I recognized his wife. He had been a very large man, but he had lost over 100 pounds. As we were riding in the car, I mentioned how good he looked. Well, he said, with a sort of northern Midwestern accent, now that I have grandchildren, I want to be around for my grandkids. That was his motive. And we, with a motive of being able to serve Christ, of the knowledge of having our bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit, are we not motivated as much as wanting to be around for our grandkids? Overcoming gluttony needs a forward look. He had the forward look at least in time. He wanted to be around for his grandkids. We need a forward look that overpowers the present look at food. A forward look that for the Christian extends into eternity. Where we've kept under our body and bring it into subjection, whereby someday we receive an eternal reward when we hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. A lot of that boils down to the fact that we need to learn contentment, and for some in the area of food. Philippians 4.11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul connects it to food in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. It doesn't say lots of food. It doesn't say fancy food. It doesn't say fancy clothes. Have you got something to eat? Do you have something to cover your body? Are you content with it, or are you so picky that you throw half of it away? My mother used to teach me a saying, want, waste not, want not. Oh, I, my folks had lots of good old-time sayings, and I'm thankful for them. Learned to be very, very, very conservative, especially in trying not to waste stuff. Contentedness in Hebrews 13. Let your conversation, that is your manner of life, be without covetousness and be content. Be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 1 Timothy 6.6 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Gluttony, perhaps, I hope we've seen tonight that it's a little more dangerous sin than often we categorize it as. The sixth evil motive is anger. We need to ask ourselves the question, am I motivated to do what I'm doing, thinking or saying, by anger? Why am I acting the way that I am right now? Why am I doing what I'm doing right now? Is it because I'm mad about something? Is it because I'm mad at somebody? If the answer is yes, I'm not fulfilling the will of God. Let me give you just a few verses on that. Proverbs 15.1 A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Guard your tongue, for out of it are the issues of life. 
Proverbs 15, 18, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Proverbs 16, 32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Ah, there we are, back to the issue of self-control. We've seen self-control and its need in the area of gluttony. Self-control is also one of the fruit of the Spirit that gives you the head start when it comes to the sin of anger. If you're motivated by anger, it means that you are not bearing the fruit of the Spirit. It means that you are not self-controlled. Self-control. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Would you rather be able to control your anger or would you rather to be the big macho, toughest dude around? It says that the one who's slow to anger is better than the mighty. You're even better than the guy that takes the city if you can control your spirit. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger and it is glory to pass over a transgression. He that soweth iniquity, there we get back to one of those sins that's connected to gluttony and connected to witchcraft and connected to stubbornness and connected to rebellion. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity and the rod of his anger shall fail. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man overcometh covereth shame. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment, for if thou deliver him, thou must do it again. Proud and haughty scorner is his name who dealeth in proud wrath. There is tied to pride the sin of the devil. A stone is heavy and the sand is weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood, so the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. It's one of those sins listed in the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Colossians 3, 8, there's a command to Christians, but now ye also put off all these. Look at the first three, anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. First Timothy 2, 2, 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. James 1, 19, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. James 1, 20, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I think probably all of us have known people who've said, I don't get mad. I just get even. Perhaps they say it with a smile, but as you watch their lives, you discover that's true. I once had a deacon in the church a long, long time ago who loved that little saying, I don't get, I don't get mad, I just get even. <laughs> you better watch out for those kind of people. The seventh evil motive is lust. I must ask myself, am I motivated to do what I am doing, thinking, or saying by lust? If the answer is yes, I'm not fulfilling God's will for my life. I think before we get into that one, I think we'll stop there. I think we'll save that for next week because we only have a few minutes left here. And um, I think most of you don't want to go another 30 minutes. So let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will grant us the guidance and direction of your Holy Spirit as we seek to examine ourselves, whether or not we are in the faith, to see what our motives are, so that we might make sure that we are in the center of your will. Father, we pray that you'll give us grace to accept what your Spirit shows us. You'll give us the grace to confess our sins of motives, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness when we confess them to you. 
Father, bring us to repentance. Bring us to repentance. To true repentance. That our motives will be pure motives. Holy motives. Motives that bring glory to Christ. Motives that are empowered by the Spirit of God and not by the flesh. For all that is of the flesh brings us into destruction. All of those motives, though they look so good and they seem so desirable and so, so tasty to us. And how we yearn for them. And so we're motivated to follow certain courses of action because we think those courses of action will get us what we want. And all they do is damage to the Christian life. All they do is defile the temple of the Holy Spirit. All they do is damage the body of Christ where we're being built as individual parts into that temple of God that Christ is building. Father, we pray that you'll give us pure and clear motives. Motives that without question and without admixture bring glory to Jesus Christ. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.